Hey, welcome to this section of the Boat Expo. Um, we're here with a, a special guest. We've got Henry Wilson from TM Custom Docks out of Anderson, South Carolina. He's been in the dock building. There you go. <laughs> been in the dock building business for years uh, and is going to share his insights. So you, if you're dealing with a dock situation or you're going to be living on the water and you're going to need to build a dock, hopefully this is going to be some very valuable information uh, that's going to help you in those decisions. So Henry, thanks for joining us. Sure, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for participating, the opportunity to participate. So tell tell everybody a little bit about your story and your your doc expertise, and we'll jump right into the meat of it. Absolutely. So I'm a mechanical engineer. I've worked in various industries over the years, I've built chemical plants, power plants, you name it. My background, I have a PhD in mechanical engineering, and I started looking at the opportunity to kind of move out of the corporate world. And being a contractor building docks seemed like a great way to, uh, to be able to stay local and not have to travel quite so much. And, and to kind of exercise, because uh, docks wiggle and move, it's kind of nice to have an engineer around to, to build on those. It, absolutely. So not just a, a guy that used to frame houses and decided, oh, I can build docks. Uh, no, somebody right. that really that really understands. So I, I appreciate you, uh, you sharing your information. So I'm going to start with these are some questions that I have. I've been around boats uh, for 40 years. Um, family has yeah. had a, a lake house. There's two lake houses in our family, uh, both with docks. And these are questions that were on my mind. So um, tell us the difference between a floating dock and a dock that's fixed on a, a with pilings on a pier. And, and when would be best for uh, for different applications? Because I've seen them both on freshwater lakes. And I'm just curious of, of your opinion on that. Sure. Every lake is going to have its own sort of specific dock uh, market. And, you know, things that work in some lakes not going to work in the other. Just generally speaking, you're going to use a floating dock in areas where the water level is going to change a great deal. And you can, you know, uh, anchor them in an effective way to deal with wind loads and other things. You know, because if it's floating, you're going to have to have a way either piles or cable guides or some sort of a structure that sort of uh, controls the dock is, and keeps it in place as the lake level or the, or the river level moves up and down. On a fixed pier dock, you're gonna use those and, and uh, lots of folks use them along the coast. Lots of folks use them on lakes where they're not necessarily like, for example, in the lake, lakes near here, they're um, flood protection lakes. So they're gonna vary a great deal throughout the year to keep the floodplain protected. And so you're going to have to be able to kind of roll a dock in, move a dock out. If you have an area where the lake's going to change um, relative to the bank, um, you know, not so much on, a, on an annual basis, or if it's a river or whatnot, you can use the piers. But most folks are going to build on pylons in places where the water level is relatively stable relative to, to the pier. So on the coast where the tide's coming in and out, you can get away with it there, you know, because you're going to be dropping into the water, you know, from uh, with cable lifts. So it kind of depends on your market, honestly. And we, we have the opportunity to service a number of floating dock applications, but uh, we let folks build, you know, like wood stick built um, docks, you know, that specialize in carpentry and whatnot. Okay, perfect. So is there a difference in cost? Is one more expensive to build than the other or more expensive to maintain than the other? I think that's gonna be lake specific because obviously you can think about some places where it's just gonna be some treated lumber on a couple of telephone poles and you know not a lot of wind load issues or things like that's gonna drive a lot of extra structure or you get um, you know sort of further north where there's gonna be really kind of hostile winter conditions that you're trying to protect against or ice flows and you need you know you're, you're gonna to have to have a robust stock to, to, to live through those kind of conditions. It honestly depends. I would think that, um, that there's some in, in a place like where we're at where we have a mild winter you know, there's a, a relative cost comparison just based on how much bling you want because, you know, you can get a really inexpensive dock or you can add toys and after toys and just max it out. It's like a car, like an F-150. You can have an XL or you can have a limited and you're going to pay a lot of different price for each one. Yeah, for sure. So we've got at our, our family's place at the Lake of the Ozarks, we've got a two slip with a huge swim platform um, sure. on the, the encapsulated foam, a floating dock that's attached to the right. seawall with um, the cables. And then my in-laws have a place in Tennessee on Lake Loudon that's the fixed dock with the pier. And I've, I was always trying to figure out, like, why didn't you put a floating dock there? And why don't we use? But that explains it, because the Lake of the Ozarks goes up and down um, in the season. And Lake Loudon sure. is, is pretty consistent from, uh, from what I understand. I mean, so, there are a few places, a few markets where you can mix one or the other. But, you know, generally speaking, folks are going to be you know, picking one and going with it in that region. Okay, and you build docks in in your Georgia, South Carolina, a little bit into to Tennessee, but your main lakes are Lake Lanier, um, Greenwood Lake, Kiwi, uh, Lake Lure. 
uh, and surrounding lakes there. So you probably see a different, um, some different situations and applications, right? Oh yeah, the, all, we have a lot of smaller lakes. Uh, lake Thurman is a relatively big lake, but it's not so much developed. Hartwell, you're going to see a mix across all those lakes because some of them are flood controls, some of them are, are, are reservoirs. So when it really boils down to is we're kind of flexible, but we focus principally on uh, floating docks and accessories for all docks. So if you've got a stick built sort of pier dock, we'll come out. We can add toys to it. But generally, I don't want to I don't want to focus on building those. It's a different craft skill set. We have a, a fabrication shop we're leveraging for the floating docks. Okay, that makes sense. We'll get to that in a little bit. Now let's let's go to lifts. So you know you've got the nice dock, or you've got just a, a very simple uh, single slip dock to, that does your purposes. Um, if you're going to go with the lift, you've got the option for a cable lift, um, a bladder lift, or like the shore station crank type lift. Talk a little right. bit about those difference positives, negatives, pros and cons. Okay, so the the cable type lifts principally going to use those on a um, a pier type dock. Because uh, you're, you're going to transfer that weight to the dock. You need to carry in capacity for it. A lot of times with that kind of swing in motion and whatnot, it's just not going to be as effective an application put on a, on a floating dock. Twenty year, we, we still run into docks 20 years ago. Somebody might have been a handy guy. They built it themselves. It had a dock like that. And they usually came here from Florida or somewhere where they just brought that <laughs> lift with them. But we, we generally use, a, we call it, you call it a bladder, um, a bladder lift. So float air, uh, fiber steel, some of those types of those companies are pretty well known. They basically have a large tank. You blow air into it, it picks it up. You can pivot from the front. You can pivot from the four, uh, four or six arms on the side. Folks always want to know where, where, where those kind of come into play. So the, the front lifts work great where you want to, to sort of deeply tie in the, the mass of the boat to the to the dock. So let's say you have a, a kind of a lightweight aluminum dock in a place with a lot of traffic and a lot of wake. It helps to have that mass sort of moving with the dock so that it helps stabilize and keep it from reacting very strongly to the to the waves coming through. The four bars tend to be a little easier to get on because you're not having to kind of drive up a hill. And so you know they, they tend to be easier to, to, to load up and then they they in some ways sort of separate the motion of the boat from the motion of the dock and you'll see it. They'll both be kind of moving, you know, under under when, when there's wakes or waves as sort of a different period. That's kind of helpful in a lot of applications, particularly the driving in straight. If you're going to loan it to your drunk uncle Teddy and he's going to come run in, it might be a little easier for him to get on that kind of lift at the end of the ball game. So what it boils down to is just th those two types of lifts definitely have their sort of range of specialization. You're talking about the crank type lift. Those are still going to be the kind of lifts you're going to try to use where you have a, um, if, if you're, if you're sitting on the, on the lake bed or you're tying it to the dock, you need a stable place to put it. So you're not going to really want to use it in a really silty lake bed. You're going to want to kind of a start a structure for it, or you're going to want to tie it into a fixed dock. So you're carrying that load again, back through the piers. And if yeah. solid, some folks will use um, the crank type for a sea lift on, on, on floating docks, but you'll see that the dock will kind of lean that direction. So you got to be careful about flotation. Yeah, and that it's it's all about the application and, and knowing what the bottom of your lake is, what the what the um, water conditions will be throughout the throughout the year. You know, our lake right. at the at the Lake of the Ozarks, our first dock just got beat to crap because we didn't account for the you know we were right off the channel in the cove and those waves just came right into the to the cove and boom, right. within three or four years, our dock was starting to crumble. Um, sure. and, uh, so we, we didn't think about that it would have been helpful to know. Um, so when people let's, come to us for a particular boat lift, we, we always ask them, where are you at on the lake? What lake are you on? Are you in an open water place? Is there high traffic? A lot of folks with the wake boats, are they turning around in front of your place a lot? Cause yeah, you're going to, you're just going to influence. It doesn't just influence the boat lift. It also influences the type of dock that you're going to buy. Cause in our case, we're, we're going to like the Lake of the Ozarks, we're principally trying to focus folks for uh, performance purposes towards steel docks that are galvanized for long-term wear. And then if you're in a place where it's well protected, it's a calm water area, then we'll do an aluminum dock. We might even do a mix between the two of them on the floating side. But really we're trying to, we're trying to design the dock that's gonna, we, we like to give a 30 year warranty. And we want something that for sure is gonna survive that long. You know, from, for us, uh, you know, quality's gonna stand, right? Yeah, yeah, you're investing a large amount of money uh, in the in the docks depending on you know you could be well into the six figures um oh, yeah. in a dock that's really not all that huge um right. and you want to make sure that's going to be standing for you know like you said 30 40 50 years uh you that's don't want right. to have to rebuild that thing like we had to I, I think it was within five years we were we were buying a whole new dock and um just that, that was money that didn't have to be spent had it been done right the first time 
That, that, that's a good point. So when I look at buying a car, I think about middle age of the car. That's when your maintenance costs are going to start being just like us, right? When you get in your 40s and 50s. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm the- past. I'm right there. I'm right there. I'm not past it yet. Well, welcome aboard. Doctor's going to love you. <laughs> you put the guys through college. So when it comes down to it, you're looking at middle age. So if I'm thinking 30 years, about 15 to 20 years, you probably have to do a little work on floats or paint it or something like that. Or, you know, just basic kind of maintenance. You know, even the decking is supposed to last 25 years. You might have to do a little work. But if you've got a dock that's kind of, you know, like a lightweight aluminum dock that's built for, by some folks focused on 12 to 15 year turnover on the dock, middle age is six or seven years. So you're going to start seeing things making noise. You're going to start things kind of moving around a little bit. Can't sustain a big storm as well as it used to about middle age. It's like a friend of mine likes BMWs. At 100,000 miles, he's putting a lot of work into it. I like I like uh, Ford F-250s and I like Camrys because I know at 200,000 miles is when I'm going to have trouble. It just what what are you focused on getting is for your money. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a that's a great point. Now let's let's go to the decking. Um, you know, a lot of new materials have come onto the market. You've got um, you know just your regular wood. Some of the new I, I'll call them composites, um, and then you've got. Um, you know, the steel and aluminum that you talked for the frame. So talk a little bit about the materials and the applications, pluses and minuses from your experience. So uh, let's talk about dock frames first. Uh, You know, steel docks traditionally, you know, out of the gate were pretty common. You know, folks have sort of migrated into doing a lot more aluminum docks over the years. And there's a, you know, the iterative design learning that you get over time has been beneficial for the dock builders like every other manufacturer. So for, for us, we see that steel dock being the place where you need the strength of steel, which is generally speaking from a fatigue and load carrying capacity, about three times that of aluminum. So, you know, erosion control, there's, I mean, erosion or not erosion, corrosion. You can protect it by painting. You can protect it by galvanizing. We love the high depth galvanized process. Lake of the Ozarks, a lot of lakes in Alabama, you know, the kind of docks that people are going to be familiar with. It's kind of what we're building for our local market with a, uh, a bar joist frame that's going to be super flexible. We try to steer clear of I-beam sections, which are going to have a very stiff corner. And if you've got a lot of motion, you're going to start getting fatigue and cracking in the corners. So on the steel side, we like flexibility and we like that lightweight plus as is something that matters to a lot of folks, when you have a bar joist dot, you can see in there, that means critters know you can see in there and you're a lot less likely to have, you know, some creepy crawlies, you know, kind of taking up house on the floats to blow your dot. Nobody likes to be swimming across the dock and have a, you know, a raccoon or a snake or something roll out. So we, we like that, uh, the bar joist for that purpose. And I think most folks, markets across the country recognize flexibility. On the aluminum side, you're almost always going to be in a box type structure. You're going to have a C channel or an I beam or something like that. And so for the aluminum, you know, there's, there's great applications and there's some manufacturers across the country, AlumaDoc, for instance, uh, Gator Docks, they build some rugged aluminum docks for some pretty robust applications. So for me, it's more of that residential dock where you're kind of looking at, um, you know, if, if I'm in an exposed place, go with the steel. Maybe you're doing aluminum for the aesthetics for the roof and whatnot, but go with the steel base. If you're in a place that's protected, go with the aluminum. If you're in a place with saltwater applications and you're doing a float water or a brackish application to a floating dock, aluminum probably makes a lot more sense to you because of just the, you know, the corrosive environment. Now you talk, no, but there's lots of opinions on that. Don't get me wrong. I'm just coming at it from sort of an engineering perspective, new to the dock business. So I'm not, I don't have a generational sort of affection for either one of the designs. So you asked about um, decking. All right. So let, let, let's, we're going to go from cheapest to most expensive on the decking. Yep. You're from the Ozarks area. You know, you probably see a ton of concrete reinforced uh, papers. That, yep. That's what we've got. Yep. And, and, and I mean, I'm going to tell you, right, they make a total, I mean, complete sense from keeping them cool, from the long-term durability, being able to move them without having to take out screws that might corrode or whatnot. So at our business, because our the, the area that I'm in, Pavers are just, you don't see them. You might see them on a marina, maybe, right? And that just right. depends on when the marina was built. We tried to introduce those into the market here over the last couple of years. We've been really um, successful doing it in commercial type docks, uh, community docks. And we've been successful at getting people to buy into it where they have like Airbnb and they just won't rug it. They don't want to get you know a one-star review because the decking on the dock needed to be cleaned or something like that. So we've had, you know, we've had the right application. Usually, like I said, it's going to be commercial, even if it's a residential like Airbnb. All right, so pavers come in some places, and in my opinion, the best way to go, if I, if my own personal doc, as soon as the, the decking's bad, I'm going to convert to pavers. So the next step would be, for me, you know, just looking at it from cost, 
uh, wood, treated wood. We had the yellow wood guy come in, the regional distributor was here, uh, some folks that actually retail it, and they're pretty clear with some of the chemical changes that the EPA has driven on the treated wood, that we needed to be very open with folks who are thinking they're going to save money and tell them it's going to be 10 years max. You're going to get 10 years exposure. It's not the treated wood from, from the 1980s where your granddad might have went out there and put transmission fluid on it to seal it. You know, you're you're going to you're going to be replacing it, but you're going to have to work your butt off on every other year to keep that treated wood looking good and keep the splinters down, et cetera. So from just a cost effectiveness, if you're, if you're thinking wood, most of the, I mean, when I say legitimate composite deck builders are going to have a, a, a contractor's grade that has a 25 year warranty, really stable um, colors, you know, some pretty uh, competitive scratch resistance or whatnot, but it's sort of a buy-in. And right now when wood's kind of, you know, comparatively expensive, it's just a no brainer. I'm going to get two and a half times the life. It's going to be a lot easier on the feet. My kids can run around on it. You know, heat wise, it's going to be a little comparable. And ultimately, you know, so if you're, if you're budget conscious, try your best to get your contractor to look at that, that, that front end, like the, the enhanced from tracks or the edge from timber tech, you're not going to go wrong in those. You're going to get a long life out of them. They're monochromatic. So they don't have a lot of colors to make them look like wood, but they have a painted wood look strong product. But if you're going to step up from that, you got a bunch of options and different ranges all the way up. And then, and the, let's say in the mid range to, to sort of high range, you've got like IPE Brazilian hardwood. I'm going to say, here's the greatest secret with the Brazilian hardwood, let it turn gray and keep it clean. And you're going to keep from having to be down on your dock twice a year, messing around with the boat dock. If you stain it, well, we're not saying if you oil it, you're going to be oiling that thing every two or three, maybe five years. And it's going to look a little tired in between there. And you're, you're buying a product that's probably good for 50 or 60 years exposed to the environment. So if you get in there on the front end and you stain it, or well, I'm sorry, if you oil it, you know, you're, you're making a part-time job for yourself. They turn gray. It's a compelling aesthetic. If you build your dock so that it kind of maximizes that contrast from grays or whatnot, or from a light, with some, like a burnished lake brown, you'll get your value out of that dock and you won't have to spend a whole bunch of money over the life cycle to take care of the, the decking. You have a whole bunch of other exotic woods that are going to be more expensive than the IPE. You know, the, there's lots of conversation about that. But when you really want to, if you really want to dress up your dock and, you know, and drive your neighbors back to the, to the drawing board as far as aesthetics, you're going to be looking at um, some of the, the AZEC sort of uh, P PVC products. And in that, in that market, you're going to be fairly expensive, pretty much similar cost to an aluminum deck. But those products are going to be like, for instance, the TimberTech AZEC is about 30% cooler than your comparable um, uh, capped type composite material from any okay. other competitor. Moisture deck has a uh, stay cool type process or whatnot that's going to be cooler too. And, and I'll tell you, the difference between 170 degrees, 160 degrees, and 130 is a whole bunch of crown kids for sure, or, or, or crown Henry's. So you know, <laughs> if you look at the composites, you're going to pay a lot more, right? So you got a thousand square foot boat dock and you go from about six or seven dollars a square foot up to 15 or 16 dollars a square foot. You know, you're, it's a you know, considerable difference in price. And so what I tell folks, you know, we, we kind of start them out with the basic and we, we let them have the opportunity to kind of uh, to, to create the aesthetic they're looking for for their lake lifestyle. And a lot of folks are relatively um, careful about the cost they spend, you know, but some folks clearly want to match their house, you know, if nice neighborhood, million dollar house, you know, go for it. Let's build everything you want. But, you know, clearly lots of differences in decking. Yeah, I, I, I like the, the advice on it, know what you're getting and know how to care for it to get the best out of it so it's okay. hey if you're if you're gonna get the what was a bamboo oh Bra yeah uh, ipe brazilian hardwood oh Bra brazilian hardwood you don't know yeah. it's gonna have that graying effect so match the colors of everything else so it looks fantastic uh and well, really, it's worry free and maintenance free that's great information yeah. um, well, I'll tell you something, something to be careful about about deck uh, decks for docks a lot of manufacturers, a lot of contractors will build your build you a great frame, and then they'll put treated lumber on top of the frame to attach the decking to, which is great, except for the fact that the chemistry for the, the material's been changed. So you've got your you've got your thirty to fifty year warranty material laying on top of something that's going to last ten years. So you at the ten to fifteen year point, you got to have somebody come out, take your decking up, put that thing back down. As a contract company, we we have focused solely on just adhering the decking directly to the steel frame or the aluminum frame. There's a little bit of extra effort associated with it. You had to use, you had to be careful with the fasteners, but we're avoiding that long-term problem. The other thing is if a dock builder is telling you they want to put a hidden fastener system or they're offering you a hidden fastener system, no manufacturer I've talked to, and, and I, you know, for cost reasons, I've talked to every manufacturer that builds composite material over the last three years. 
none of them will tell you, yeah, that's a great idea to put a hidden faster system on a dock. So be very suspicious. And this is one of the questions you talked about here about what to watch out for. Yep. If, if someone's talking to you doing a hidden fastener system and it isn't a screw that goes down through the top and has a plug on top of it, they are doing you an incredible financial disservice. So t- tell me about the hidden fastener system. Is that just going into the like the edge of the of the plank to the side or I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump off screen here just one second? Yep, you're good. You're good. All right. So two two oddball colors here. So you see the little groove in the side of it, right? Yep. So imagine you have a little disc that goes between those and you put a screw through that. So you, you put you put the disc in, you put the screw through it, you slide this piece into it and it keys it and you just keep kind of walking across the board. So a yep. couple of issues you're going to get. Some manufacturers don't have a provision for taking that screw out and taking boards out for maintenance. So your main, so the guy that's fixing a broken board that your drunk Uncle Ted burned, he's going to take off 20 boards to get to it. But that plastic piece between there, imagine the dock is moving constantly. I mean, Oh, yeah. Moving. Well, that thing's going to flex and eventually it's going to fatigue and break on you. And now you've got boards that are loose, it's, you know, and, and imagine a little baby, a baby toe between these two pieces of board. Terrible idea, right? So anybody that's telling you and that they're going to be able to put a, um, a hidden faster system on there hasn't talked to their manufacturer's rep because none of the companies will tell you that that's a good idea. None of them. Look, looks none great of- for the first six months, but over the long haul, you're going to have issues. What's the use in having a 50 year warranty on something if the, if the installation's only going to be good for eight or 10 years? That's just yeah, a great way that, to it. Yeah, that's great. I, I didn't know that. I, I wasn't aware of that, uh, that system. So, what are some other mistakes that people make when they're looking at, at docks? Uh, so, so, here's the deal right out of the gate uh, do- boats are getting bigger everywhere boats are getting bigger right? you know i mean obviously the 1950s i mean you know everybody's income and everything was lower but since the 80s people are going to the lake you know we're all actually focused on retirement in a way that people in past generations didn't etc cetera, etc cetera. your first boat might be reasonable the second boat and you get out there and you have a good you know good opportunity to get one nobody's going hey i'm going to downscale my boat they're downscaling houses they won't downscale their boat so when you buy a dock make sure you got enough room for what you know that next boat Make sure the slip's big enough for your next boat. Make sure the slip, slip and the overhang's big enough to cover the boat you got, but gives you a little bit of wiggle room. Something else, you're buying a boat lift. For us, it's only about, uh, we generally sell about 6,800 pound boat lifts and then an 8,000. And then after that, you know, there's the world's the limit you know, up to 24,000 pounds. But the difference in cost between those is about $400. So we tell folks, your lift's gonna last you 30 years. I mean, all the reputable dealers in my area, um, Carolina Lift, uh, the fiber steel guys, the Hydro Hoist, their lifts are gonna last you a long time. But if you outgrow it, then you're doubling your cost of the lift over the life cycle of it. So buy the lift that you're gonna be able to use for the entire time you plan to be on the docks. And just assume you're gonna get a great deal offered to you at some point and you're gonna get a bigger boat. Just assume it out of the gate. That's a huge mistake that people make. The other piece is the dock, de- dock builders. You know, we, we're all um, building over the water requires construction workers that also want to work in the worst possible conditions out in the middle of nowhere where there's not going to be anybody to come if you're in trouble. You imagine that narrows down the type of construction folks you're going to get. Right. So dock builders tend, you know, you can you can look and see if they've been building boat docks for 30 years and they won't take you out to see any of them, then they've got a terrible reputation. If they're willing to you know to show you 25 of their docks. Even the ones that have been out there a long time. In our case, we've had docks in water for 30 years. It still look great. You know, they're they're still in prime condition. We would love to show you even our older docks because we're still kind of leveraging that a technique. If you got guys that are cautious or careful about taking you out on a boat dock tour, you pretty much know they got some trouble. They don't want you to run into a final customer, a former customer, or you know. And I hate to say this is because buy-in is what it is. But if you have a dock building company that's only been on the water two or three years and they've only built five or six of them. I mean, all of us make mistakes. I over-engineer everything, but you're going to make mistakes. They may not have had time to really learn what makes their docks hum. And so, you know, it's just like buying the first year you got a new car. Just, you know, be cautious. Make sure you get a good deal and make sure, and this is a key piece, that you and the dock builder have a good relationship and have good chemistry. The last thing you want to do is own something for a long, long time. And, you know, you, you don't quite get along with the guy that built it, or you know, and then you're trying to get him to come maintain it and you've got, you know, friction. We, we try to make sure that we're going to have a great relationship with the customer. Sometimes you can see it's just not going to work out. You don't have good chemistry. Maybe you got different value systems or whatnot. You know, we try to let those guys go on down the road and get somebody else to work with them that may work with them really well. Be careful who you get to do your work. The other piece is who's maintaining your work. Here at our company, our services business on docks is, this, is the same size 
in normal years as our um, new doc business. In, in gravy years like this one, you know, our new doc business is going to outscale it. And in years of recession, we're probably going to be doing more service work. We want to do that because I want to go see how everybody else's docs break. I want to see how my docs break. I want to see the little headaches that people really, really can't stand to have to deal with because I don't want to do that anymore. I mean, that's great feedback. So we, we use both those businesses as a complement. Well, we have a whole lot of folks every year, when, particularly when the economy is good and when the economy is bad, they say, hell, I, you know, I've been building stuff a long time. And I can, I've got great skills, you know, carpenter, welder, whatnot. And I got a pontoon that, you know, I don't care if I tear the carpet up. So I'm going to go out and start a business on the lake. No insurance, you know, no background in it, really no health. You know, so when you hire those kind of guys, you're going to get a great discount. I mean, I know I'm never going to be lower cost than those folks, but I'm going to be held to a higher standard from an engineering perspective, a higher standard from a market perspective. And so you may be chasing a value, but are you going to get a value long-term? So make sure the guy that does the maintenance on your dock does the service work on your dock, comes out and checks your equipment. Make sure that's the kind of guy you want from a mechanic. You know, there's always a, a double wide trailer somewhere with two broke down cars in front of it. Some guy's working on, you can hire that guy or you can hire the guy that's certified at the factory to come by the factory to take care of your equipment. You're going to pay a different price. You're going to get a value statement that's different from either one of those. Same way with docs. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. The long term, my, my father-in-law, they just bought a place two, three years ago and had their um, had their deck built or their dock built. And yeah, that relationship of, hey, we want to do this. Well, let me tell you why you shouldn't do this, but we can accomplish the same thing by doing this. And just that mm -hmm. level of expertise, the level of knowledge and experience, like you said, is, is going to be valuable down the line. You're going to pay for it, but right. you're going to have such a better experience long term and you're not going to five, 10 years down the line have uh, it's similar to buying a boat have repairs and things that are just a headache and an annoyance when you're That's down right. to your dock you're like oh i hate that part and um yeah that it's it's worth it in most situations so uh, i'll give you a quick example about selling on value when you talk to your dock builder we have an incredible number of folks that come in and say hey i want to i want the max size dock i can get and i want you to put a party deck on the top of it and i want it to have a roof on top of that etc and i say so you got a huge family no it's just my wife and i and, you know, so you love being out in the heat, you love being in the sun, you're going to, he's like, nah, not really. We kind of hang out at the house, you know, we get on the boat, we go puttering around. So my next question is, you, why do you want to spend two and a half times the amount of money on a party deck and get up there and sweat in the sun? You know, if you're going to have, and then people that have a real strong bank might need the, the space, but if you don't have a strong bank and you don't have a whole lot of folks who are going to come over, why are you going to spend that money? Asking that question and selling them what they need you know, it's, it's, it's value sales. It's what you're going to get a Honda dealership or Toyota, right? We're not trying to push it off like a used car. So in our case, we ask those questions. We want you to be happy. And if you're never going up on the party deck, you're not getting your money's worth out of it. We haven't done our, you know, we haven't done our job to help steer in the right direction. That's the dock builder that you want. Not saying that we're perfect, but there's a lot of folks out there that have that same value statement sort of focus. That's who you're looking for to build your dock. Yeah, for sure. I love that. Any, let's talk about maintenance. You, you mentioned that any, uh, what's the maintenance required on a dock and, and what are some things that people often miss that can, can cost them dearly down the line? So let's, let's just, we'll talk floating docks and then I'll talk on the pier docks on a floating dock. Take care of your floats. If you start seeing a list in one direction, or if you start seeing less than, I don't know who everybody's designs across the country, but generally, if you get within four to six inches of your frame from the water, your frame's getting constantly wet, right? So if you keep a floating dock out of the water, aluminum corrodes, right? Steel corrodes, galvanized steel will corrode, paint steel will corrode. You want to keep that thing well floated. So the first thing you want to do is if you have some critter that's living on top of your float and digging holes in it, drunk Uncle Ted's rammed into the float, any of those kind of float type damage or big storm and you lose one, get that thing back in there because nothing good comes from uneven flotation or sort of listen to the side and particularly in storms, take care of your floats. The other thing is you start seeing a scratch or rust, you've, you've, you've carried a cooler down the walkway and you've scratched it, get that touched up because nothing's going to create a more tired and sort of distressed look than small things going on. It's just like a car. If, if you know, the switch breaks on the window and you say the heck with it, I'll, you know, I'll just leave that window up, then the horn breaks. All of a sudden, the whole car is just, you know, it's a train, right? It's a broken window, right? It just becomes a bad neighborhood. Same with a dock. Take care of the small stuff as you go. Have somebody you have a good relationship with that won't work you over on costs and keep it up. And in 30 years, this will have a nice dock. That, that, that's the key piece. But the other up front, buy a dock that's not going to be high maintenance to begin with. Like we talked about earlier, watch the IP, don't do treated lumber, keep it up on a regular basis. On the pier type docks, uh, uh, don't buy, <laughs> if you can get away with it, 
do not buy a um, telephone pole as a peer because they're limited to 50 years. And I, I live on a farm. We have a, we have a, a, a house on telephone poles that's 55 years old. And so Dr. Wilson's trying to figure out how to lift that house up and put new peers under it so that everybody can keep having that resource. Let me tell you, even doing it myself and doing all the engineering myself and doing all the planning myself, it's a, it's a pretty big pill to pay, right? But if you do aluminum or you do steel or you know, steel wrapped with materials that are gonna, gonna keep it you know, protected from the environment, you're gonna get a lot more than 50 years out of it. And it may not seem like a big nail now. Lots of folks are like, well, I won't even be here. Somebody else's problem. But when you go to sell it, you pass it down, you never know. So buy value on the front end. Yeah, I, I love that. That's great. Um, so are there any, are there any must-haves when you're building the dock that you almost everybody is say, hey, you really should consider doing this uh, or adding this uh, with the docks? I'll tell you two things that we do that we give away because they're a lost lead when we go out to do them after the dock is built and installed. So uh, dock boxes, you gotta have a place to put your junk, you got to. And you can do overhead storage places and things like that on the docks, but the best thing in the world is these like fiberglass dock boxes are just wonderful, but they take up a lot of space on top of your deck, right? So we do two cantilever arms on the lakeside portion of the dock where you're not gonna have a lot of traffic from boats or sea dews or anything like that. We put it out there, we cantilever it off the deck, you know, you, you can still sit on it, you can still hang out with it, but it's out of the walking space, the usable space of your dock. So those things cost me about 14 bucks to build and put onto the dock in the shop. They cost me an entire trip out there for two technicians for two or three hours to go out there and weld them and touch things up once it's all built. So you can imagine the cost is significant. So I just give them to people. Tell me where you want them so I don't have to lose money coming out there to put them on later. Even if you don't <laughs> have the dock by it, you can put some decking on it. You can put a cooler on there. You can put tools on there. You can do whatever you want, but just let me put them on there. The other thing I think is a must have is where do you want your bench beam? So, you know, in the superstructure of the dock, where do you want me to have my guys fab in the shop here, a very simple beam that we're gonna put in there so you can have the two seat out there with my wife kind of hanging out watching the sun down. Where do you want that at? I give that one for free too, because I can use a drop from a piece of material that we've cut for something else, fact, you know, fabricate it up, install it in about five minutes, and, you know, it probably cost me 20 bucks or 30 bucks of labor, or I can come all the way out there when you, you know, eventually want to get a place to sit and kind of relax and have some fun. And then uh, personally, I think that's um, a value statement that you can't get away. Ladders. The one thing that folks got to take, I'm, I'm a big guy and I sort of took for granted how important knee health was going to be when I got older. When I was in sports <laughs> now. So you have two kinds of ladders. You have a straight ladder and you got to pull all your weight up and climb up out of the ladder, uh, out of the water. If you can get, we call them a dog ladder, but if you can get an inclined ladder um, that gets you down in the water far enough, yeah, your dog can climb it, but it is infinitely easier to climb a set of stairs at, versus climbing a straight ladder. So, you know, everybody's talking to be a little bit different, but if you can get some stairs down into the water, you're going to do grandma and grandpa some good. And if you've abused your body in the way that I have, you're going to do your knees and stuff some good as well. So th those are, to me, those are three things. After that, boat lifts, American flags hanging up on you know, posts. You know, there's all sorts of stuff that you can get, but those three things, pretty much everybody eventually comes around to want on their boat dock. Yeah, I, I like that. And I, I liked your saying about planning where you want it ahead of time. It, it, one of the things my father-in-law did is they, they were in the middle of construction. They already had it, the pilings driven, framed up. And he said, oh, by the way, I think we're going to add some jet ski lifts. And the guy said, yeah. if you would have just told me that six months before we got started, I could have had, you know, it had been much easier and it would have looked much better instead of That's adding right. it on after the fact. So kind of thinking that ahead of what's going to be down the line, even a year or two, even three years down the line, um, yeah. makes everything look better and, and easier and probably less expensive, I would imagine. Well, here's the other side. Folks come to me, they, they've never been, a, never even been on a boat before. And they decide, hey, you know, Florida's too hot. We're going to move out here on the lake. They don't even know what they don't know, right? So they might ride around on the boat a few times. They might rent a boat. They might have a realtor that cares about on the boat. They got no idea. So as a dock builder, I'm going to ask them, hey, you think, you know, in the future, how, how old are your kids? You got 12-year-olds. They're going to be a teenager. They're going to want a sea dude. Trust me. They're going to want a sea dude. <laughs> they're going to want their buddy to bring his sea dude. So we, we ask folks, wh where are you going with this? Like I told you earlier, it's a couple. They don't have a big family. They're not going to have visitors. They're not going to entertain or if it's a guy that, you know, that looks like he came out of the outdoors magazine, you know, he's going to want to have sea dudes. So we, we ask those folks and we give them, we design the dock for the freedom for them to do that in the future. If it's not today, five years, 10 years from now, they may do it. We want to give them that freedom. 
So in my case, your 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 dad is that who it was? It was my father-in-law in that case. Yeah, his dock builder should have asked him. Hey, man, do you think there's ever a chance you're going to want these kind of widgets? Or if you sell it, you know, is the market kind of leaning towards you should have that option for folks? So you know, it's yeah. a two-way street. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Just thinking ahead. Um, one of the things that um, that uh, I want to ask you is about the where the dock is located. Your quiet cove. Um, in a rough channel with movements of water, what are some things to our levels of water? What are some things to consider there? Hey, this is a unique situation that you really have to think ahead and plan how you're going to adjust for those conditions. Anything like that that jumps out at you, Henry? I'll tell you this. If you've not been boating your entire life and, or, you know, or weren't a boatswain's mate in the military, in the Navy, then you need to kind of take into account currents and prevailing winds. I was, uh, you know, if, if you're, if you've got, if you're going to have the propensity to buy bigger docks, I mean, a bigger boat, and bigger boat, bigger boat, getting that thing into a, into a slip that's kind of sitting still while you're kind of coming in fighting a current, you know, it takes skill, it takes practice. And, and, and there's a lot that I can do as a dock builder to come in there and look at what's happening and put in things that'll help guide you in or bumpers or whatnot. But if you'd have clocked that thing 90 degrees and you were coming in with the wind or with the current, or even coming in, you know, or working against it, but you're going to be able to guide in there. That makes a big difference for your just average everyday guy, or even, or even better. If you're in a tight cove and you got to kind of turn back up, move forward, back up a little bit more so that you can come straight in. Why didn't you clock that one 90 degrees? And, and another piece of that is if you do try to, to, to take a regular dock and move it 90 degrees is your dock builder saying, well, okay, I can do it. But attaching your walkway to the finger, the little narrow section of the dock, is not quite like attaching it to the header or to the. So we're going to add a few things in. You should expect to see this. You know, your dock builder should be able to engineer that on the front end so that it's not just, uh, you know, we're going to move your walkway and just let whatever happen happen. That, that's a good dock builder. It's going to help you out in that way. The things that you got to look at for location. If I'm in a big water area and the prevailing winds come my way, when there's a storm and the storm's running from that prevailing winds location, you're going to get a lot of waves. You don't want to buy a lightweight, you know, it may be sexy looking, but you don't want to buy a lightweight aluminum dock. You want to buy something that's got some heft to it because you know for a fact it's going to take a beating. And the worst thing that's going to happen is you start falling apart during the storm. It's going to tear your neighbor's stuff up too. In yeah. our case, we look, we'll tell folks, you can go somewhere else and buy the aluminum dock that's for that application. But if you're asking me my opinion, you should go with a really heavy duty, rugged steel dock with a very flexible frame because it's going to last for the years. And if you're in that situation where you got prevailing winds and you're on piles, or is your builder telling you, hey, you're going to need more than just two? Is your builder telling you that if you've got like a bank anchor system, is he saying, hey, up, upwind, we're going to put two and we're going to put something you know, like an anchor in the water to help you. That way your dock's going to stay in the place. You know, it's a conversation about experience, but every location and every lake is going to be different. And, you're, you know, your dock builder's got to be going out there and take kind of uh, responsibility for helping keep you out of trouble. In our case, if you're in the back of a cove, you're protected. There's no wake boat traffic. There's no, you know, like in some places might be barge traffic or out on Lake of the Ozarks where they got these McMansions floating around. So you're going <laughs> to need a lot of weight, right? But if you're in a super protected area, you can go with a lighter weight dock. You can go with a, you know, with a light gauge aluminum dock, kind of save yourself some money. I mean, what's the worst that's going to happen to it? I mean, maybe a tree falls on it. Somebody hits it with a boat. So yeah, there's a lot there, but it's every market. If you're on a river and you've got, um, you've got basically the motion of, of the water on a constant basis, you know, your dock builder ought to be able to account for that, particularly if it's going to be, you know, transverse to the dock and it's going to be looking, trying to knocking it loose all the time. All that, I mean, th there's so many details there. Uh, friends of mine that have uh, applications where the lake freezes and they have to have a gadget in the water to keep, the, keep it from freezing immediately around the piles. I mean, that's a consideration you're just never going to have in the South. But right. you get more Southern than me, you know, pretty much very often you're going to get hurricane force winds. You know, so you got to be able to account for that as well, right? And so there's every, every, the best part about dock businesses, most stuff made in America and most of it's local. And you're going to have a relationship with a guy for a long time. Now, I know that yeah. if I take off a customer, I'm going to be running into that guy at the grocery store and we run into him everywhere. It's relationship focused. It's one of the great, well, my opinion, one of the last industries that's going to be like that no matter what you do, because you can't really globally corporatize something that's so localized. Yeah, yeah, the that's going to be a, a lake by lake, region by region relationship in, in that right. the local knowledge, asking the right questions of the owner, because they've, you know, likely you're going to build one dock in your lifetime, maybe two. Um, right. And there's just which way you're going to load it, uh, where you're going to attach the walkway, 
what side do you want the swim deck on and where do you want shade? What, where do you want the lifts? All of that stuff is a, a give and take. The, the owner should know about what it's going to look like. The dock builder should be able to ask the questions to pull out the right. uh, avoid all the, the the pitfalls that could be there i, I really right. like that uh, that give and take here's a question that i ask i'm sorry i'm sorry to talk over you here's a question i like to ask when do you want the sun you want morning sun go down there with a coffee and wake up you want even evening sun after dinner you're going to be sitting out there you know or is you want to go out there and cook like bacon which one is it and so yeah. every, you know the people's answers will be dramatically different based on the you know well just their opinions or their life conditions or whatnot so yeah, that, lots of questions to ask folks. That that's perfect. Um, any any areas that you say, hey, this is a good spot to save some money. You, you mentioned the upper deck. Hey, if you're not sun worshippers, if you're if you're not a party people, um, you know, don't don't increase the price of your deck for something you're not going to use. Just put a regular roof on it. Anything else like that that jumps out to you? That man, that's a great opportunity to save for a lot of people. Well, on, on the party decks, we'll tell folks. You know, look, if you absolutely find out you need it, then, you know, the, the cost is about 25% more for me to come out there and retrofit one. So you get out there and you know you need it. You've never been on the lake before. You, you kind of think you'd like it because it's, you know, they're attractive. And, oh, yeah. and, and from a life, if you're signaling what kind of lifestyle you live on the lake or whatever, that definitely shows, you know, we're partying and having a great time out here. But if you're never going to get any value out of it, don't do it. You prove that you will. Get us to come back later. It's the same thing with lots of these bumper systems that you can get and guide rollers and whatnot. The thing I tell folks when they're looking in our showroom and they're like, hey, you know, lots of the technical guys love the gadgets. They love all those little, you know, odds and ends or whatever. I just tell them, look, let's get you in there. Let's see how you drive your boat. Let's see how it works for you. And then we'll come back and fix the problem instead of you spending two or three or $4,000 and stuff. They're not really going to give any value. And then you got to maintain it and keep it looking good over the years. You know, let's fix your problem instead of hoping that this is a solution to something that may or may not ever happen. That saves people a ton of money. The other thing is, I know this sounds counter to the profit uh, opportunities you might want to be chasing when you're doing sales. I tell folks, there's always a holiday. There's always a birthday. There's always an anniversary when you can buy that little gadget or widget. Get out there and find out what you really want to have on your boat dock. So, yeah, the boat is kind of important if you want to take care of it. We have a product called the Tutsal's Boat Cover that's a wonderful way to take care of your boat. But honestly, if you're completely in the shade, you don't have to worry about people stealing stuff. If your boat costs 2000 bucks, why buy that thing? Right. You need to, you know, some of us return on investment as an engineer, I'm focused on, but most folks, they don't even know what they need until they get out there and start using it. So if you're very new to it, play with the thing for a while and then we'll, we'll come out there and kind of help you move to the next level. Yeah, I, I like that. I use the same philosophies on buying a boat as, hey, if you don't know, go out and rent a boat for a day. Um, get a sense for what it's going to be like. And that's going to help you make, uh, you know, if you're going to spend 50, 100 grand. That's fine, but know exactly that you're you're making the smart decision. It won't cost you down the line. Um, are, are there any options that you say, "Hey, man, this is this is one that almost everybody is going to find value in." Um, that uh, that we add, like the dock boxes. You said, "Hey, we, we just right. throw that in because it's it's such an inexpensive thing and it's so valuable to get it done at the time of building." Anything that jumps out at you there? I like LED lights. I like LED lights around the perimeter. They're kind of hidden. And I, I would love if everybody would move away from these little canister type or, you know, just this anything that's kind of limited to the location of the slip. Love for most folks to stop putting lights over the slips because when you get a bigger boat, it hits. You want to buy a boat cover? It's a problem. Put them out over where you're, where you're going to be walking at and it'll shine back into your boat regardless of how you cover it. But LED lights, the idea that I don't got to get on a ladder and go down and replace light bulbs or to put in new incandescents or take out a fixture, LED lights. Plus, if you, you can get them with a remote controller and when you're coming in and everybody's dock looks exactly the same, change the color of my LED lights or blink them on and off. I mean, that's super nice, right? So to me, that I mean, that sounds kind of like a simple idea, but it, it just makes a world of difference on the boat dock, just from a climate perspective. Nice um, golden white lights in the evening when you're trying to have like a little party out there and sit around the table. Yeah, it just sets a mood. LED lights all day long. I think that's the, just great and it's simple. Um, if you have the opportunity to put maybe a little bit of a vaulted area on there where you can have a ceiling fan and, it, and the ceiling fan is not really going to knock down the temperature too much on the dock where you got winds or whatnot. But again, that sets that sort of a lifestyle type climate. You know, we have customers that come to the lake three times a year. They might rent it or they might let their docks in there. They come to the lake and they end up having to pressure wash or hire somebody to fix something. 
the customers that have the best experience are the ones that come to the lake. They don't got to do a lot of work. They go down, they, you know, turn on the ceiling fan. It's got that nice little hum to it. They got the background lights. They're comfortable. They're going out on their boat. They got a lift that takes care of them every time. That's easy to get on and off of. And then they got some accessories. Like we, in our region, I don't know where it's like everywhere else. We have a little bench that you can bolt to the front of the dock. And you just climb down and you just sit in there with your legs in the water and you enjoy, enjoy a cocktail, hang out with somebody, swim a little bit. Those are the kind of things that makes it worth having a dock house in a, in a, in a place at the lake or a place on the river, you know, relative to the, you know, the incredible expense of it. That little bit of just extra um, environment. No, no. Like at a restaurant. The you know, ambiance. You know, ambiance, right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly what it is. And then other little things like a place to put stuff. Get a rack to hang up the life preservers so they're there and nobody's got an excuse for not taking one. Get a place to hang the kayaks, right? If you're a kayaker and get a little device that makes it where anybody can lift them so you don't have that excuse from your kids. Like I've had, uh, well, Pop, I'm sorry the thing disappeared, but, you know, I, I didn't want to have to drag it up onto the boat because it's so heavy. Yep. You know, making it easy to do it, right? Because you want to go on the dock and go have fun. Who wants to work and, you know, work up a sweat doing something other than having fun? No thanks. Yeah, I, I, I like those. I, I like the gear, the organization for your gear, because there will be a lot of toys that um, that will be used at the at the lake. Uh, I want to mention right. something about lights that you, that struck me. You kind of glossed on it. Is don't put your lights directly over your boat. You're you're right. attracting bugs. You're attracting spiders, and right. you're you've just added more work to your uh, to your outings. Yes. Um, and I also my recommendation is keep the lighting low and subtle yeah. uh, you don't want your lock your dock lit up like a, a christmas tree you're again you're attracting bugs and you're attracting all those critters a nice yeah. low ambiance I, I i like that um where you were going with that having the right ambiance for being at the lake and relaxing you know you, you're not in a white room where you need to see everything crystal clear you just want a nice subtle light so you can see and not fall in the water uh, but keep the bugs down. Yeah, the, the bugs, uh, spiders pooping on the boat, probably spiders sell more of our tonsils covers for us. Than <laughs> so I'm pro spider, but it, the product attracts us like a spider killer. We send folks to it. A light spray about every six weeks tends to address wasp and spiders and all kinds of other, you know, things. You know, we, I don't have any kind of interest in the, in the market or whatever, but that seems to be a pretty good insecticide for boat dock applications. But something that you're talking about as far as just setting the ambiance on the lights, have your lights straight down. Some lakes require it. Don't be flashing it out to the lake because from a navigation perspective at night, that looks like a boat coming towards me. Or, yep. you know, or it's a, be, be respectful of the other folks on the lake and maybe they'll be respectful of you when it comes to their wake and whatnot. So the LEDs, I, like I said, I like to hide them so you can't see them. And then you've got all the flexibility of the atmosphere too. Uh, yeah. The other thing is little canister lights. You drill a, a one-inch hole into your deck and drop them in. They're solar-powered. You're going to have them for 10 years or more. You just pop them out with another one in it. They come on automatically. They power, you know, they're basically solar powered. I've had an um, incredible good run with those things because you're just looking for, you know, like you said, lighting to get out there on it, lighting to get on the boat. You know, and if you're out there having cocktails or whatnot, have a couple of other lights that are very subtle. Yeah, it, it does set the, it does set the, um, the lake living lifestyle off for sure. Yeah, yeah. And there, there's a reason we're all on the water is it, it's to – relax from all the hard work that we do during the week and just get away um right. so so think about those things um what are some what are some questions you would ask some things that um to be on the lookout for on the the dock builder that you want to run from and the dock builder like you guys are that you say hey these people are going to take care of me not only to build the dock and finish on time and return my phone calls, but be there five years down the line when I need something else added or done or repaired. Well, let's just start with um, if you're if you're just talking docs. A lot of folks, uh, developers, a lot of folks are thinking about maybe flipping a house for permit reasons. A lot of folks will be interested in a used dock. And so what we what we tell folks out of the gate, you just bought a house. We have a program where we do what we call a condition assessment. It's not an inspection like with all the legal terms. We basically just have somebody that's been doing this stuff 10 or so years with me. We go out before you buy it at the realtor's request or after you buy it. And we're basically say, hey, you know, this is the things I see. We give you the sheet. I know that they're going to show it to my competitors. So there's an accountability right there out of the gate. And I just tell folks, hey, you know, in five years or so, just based on the condition of your floats, you're probably going to be placing the floats. Hey, you know, you might want to have somebody come touch up the paint or, you know, worse than that. 
hey, this this deck is not repairable. You know, get another year or two out of it and get ready, and you're going to spend ten or twelve thousand bucks on new decking. So we we found that just giving those folks, particularly in the real estate uh, process when they're buying, it kind of opens people's eyes to it. We found that it works for us commercially, obviously, because we're telling folks, hey, you probably need some work. Give us you know, give us an opportunity. If you have a dock builder that's helping you in that regard, like when you're buying a new dock or when you're buying a used dock or a place with a used dock, and I, I tell customers, do not buy a used dock from, from you know Joe down the street until let's come down there and look at it. And the thing that I tell them is, I'm going to give you the report and I'm going to give Joe Homemaker the report. So there's accountability there. So in our case, right, that transparency that we're shooting from that, that I brought over from the corporate world, that's one thing that you're going to be looking for from your from your dock builder. If they're not interested in kind of keeping you out of trouble, if the focus is solely on sales, and we we have some competitors that get one bite out of the apple. My motto is I like to have a lot of small bites of a bunch of apples over the years. So if they're kind of focused on that one single dock building trans, transaction and you don't sort of feel like there's a life cycle of opportunity for you to have a relationship with those folks, run, run from that guy. And if you talk out on the lake with folks and they say, okay, Henry built us a dock. We had an issue with the hinge. It was squeaking really bad and it took him six months to get out here to fix it. That's a problem too. Cause yeah, there's lots of opportunities to build new docks right now. But the reality is I want your referral. I want your referral today and 20 years from now. So if you've got a headache from a brand new dock or some work that I did and I don't have the bandwidth to send, a, send somebody out there to take care of it. So maybe I'm too busy to take care of those small problems. You know, without that, if you're not managing your business so that you have the bandwidth to take care of warranty problems, to take care of the small issues, to do service work for a guy that might be referring people to you on a daily basis, you know, there's a, there's a, you're missing out on the profit potential of it, but you're also not caretaking the relationship. So ask your, ask your friends, hey, that's a pretty dock. You know, when you've had problems with it, have they showed up? And we, you know, we have some competitors that build beautiful docks. And then the reason they, you know, they choose to go to somebody else for maintenance and their next docks and referrals is they got to chase them for two or three years to get them to take responsibility for something that's just a minor maintenance issue. And, and, that, and there are a lot of ways for a dock to get damaged. It's like an air conditioner system. The air conditioner guys, the guy that designed it, he can blame it on the contractor that put it in. The contractor that put it in can blame it on you or the guy that you're using to maintain it. And the guy that's maintaining it, he can always blame it on the other guys upstream. On a dock, it's the same way. You can have a bad storm, drunk Uncle Ted's. You can have a tree that falls on it. You can just have terrible conditions where you're at. If the dock builder is not accounting for all that stuff on the front end and you're having headache after headache after headache with the survivability of your dock, clearly let your neighbors know. But on the opposite side of that, if your neighbors are telling you that's the kind of guy, even if they're lower cost or their docks are sexier looking, be, be mindful for the fact that, yeah, you might think you're going to turn over the dock house in about seven years and move on, which is about the life cycle of it. It might be that in seven years, your kids are like, hey, Pop, can I have that place? Can I buy it out from you? So you might have a longer relationship than you anticipate. And that's another thing. We have a lot of folks come, come to us 60, 65, 70, and they'll say, man, I'm not worried about 10 years from now. You never know how you might be engaged with that thing 10 years from now. Yeah. We have a lot of folks in career, they're getting ready for retirement. Those guys are thinking 20 years. Find a dock builder that's going to help you through that life cycle. If you're going to flip it in seven years, find a guy that's going to build you a dock that's going to be sexy in seven years and easy to sell, not a big headache. You don't lose a deal because of something that you bought that was junk in the first place. Yeah, yeah, I like that. You mentioned one thing about the buying a home and getting the dock inspected. Um, let's, I think this is a good place to put it in. If the if the dock is set up for, uh, let's say, a bow rider, and you know you're going to get a pontoon or vice versa, what are some considerations there, and what kind of expense can you expect to get it ready? So just, just a regular dock, and all you're basically doing is converting bump to bump. You know, lots of different manufacturers. Some manufacturers are very careful with regards to pricing of their materials when they sell it to just any, anybody. So if I don't represent your boat lift, I'm probably going to charge a little bit more for materials. Generally speaking, you're probably going to spend between $1,200 and $2,200 to switch them over. I mean, if you've got some sort of an offshore boat with, you know, you've got a world cat and you're bringing it to a tiny lake and you want to put it in there, you're probably not going to be able to do that for $2,000. But just generally speaking, lake to lake you're going to be spending some cash. Something you talked about a second ago that'll be picked up when somebody does the inspection. And so if you're, you're moving to a place, it's a bare lot and you're thinking, I'm going to buy a used dock and move it over here. Sometimes it'll come with toys. Sometimes it won't. You got to calculate that into it. But if you're looking at buying a used dock and it's something I kind of missed on a second ago, so I apologize for circling back. Calculate in what it's going to take to move it to your place. Calculate in any of the repairs that's going to be associated with a dock. Because what I tell folks, when I go out and look, You've got a beautiful dock here. It's got a great frame, but you need 
a deck. You need new floats. You need new bumpers. You're going to have to paint this thing. So your costs are going to be 60 to 70% of a new one. Do you want to take that money and put it towards a new one, sell this dock? In general, you can sell your dock for between 30 and 60% of what a new one costs and come out, maybe spend a little bit more, but have exactly what you want versus the headaches and the risk associated with, you know, um, redoing a dock. Some folks are going to want to do that, or some folks are handy, they're going to want to do it. But when you start looking at it, you know, just uh, any good deal that you're going to get from a used dock, you know, have us come out and take a look at it because you may not realize it needs floats. You may not realize that there's a crack in the frame that's going to cost $10,000 with a rig and whatnot to fix. You know, let us come out and take a look at it. Just like if you're buying a used car, take it to your mechanic and let them keep you out of trouble. So we do the condition reports because I don't want to have to try to keep chasing a dock that you own and, you know, sort of low cost service work over a long period of time. And you're never happy with that dock because you tried to get a deal and you're going to spend the same amount of money regardless. So that's the same way with the boat list. The conversion is one thing, but is the dock, is the, is the boat going to be heavier than what that thing's rated for? Or have we had headaches with that year model of boat lift you have? So it might be better for you to turn that around to somebody else and let them use it for a smaller boat and you step up so you can avoid a bunch of the maintenance headaches. So yeah, 2000 bucks to convert it. A lot of questions to answer before you maybe just put your money into it. That that's great. Is there is there a way to tell what the capacity of the lift is if you're in that situation? You're you're buying a, a home and it's already got a dock there, and you don't know is it a five thousand pound lift? Is it an eight thousand pound lift? Um, is there a, a place that you can find that information on it? Yeah, generally, there's going to be sort of a model or service number on there, right? And you'll and you'll know who the manufacturer is. Get that thing off. You know, for Hydro Hoist, you know they're, they're a remarkable company with regards to record keeping or whatnot, and and. And they keep folks, you know, kind of in their market for a long period of time. So they'll know the history. So you, you call your call your local hydro hoist guy and you say, hey, I've got this thing. He may even remember when he put it in, right, and what it is. Or he may have a written, like in my case, I bought a business, didn't even have, they didn't, they didn't use computers. It's all paper. So I have file cabinets for everything they put in for 30 years. So I go back and find that and tell you exactly what it is, when it was bought, you know, how it was put in, was it used when they bought it? Lots of dock builders are going to have that information for you. If for some reason your dock was moved from somewhere else, you don't know who owned it before, you can't tell them what it is, just call a reputable dock service technician to come out there and they'll eyeball it and out of the gate, they'll tell you, hey, this is a such and such and it's a whatever. That my guys that do the, the boat list, you know, they can see it from the bank and tell you everything, you know, like, the, like a whole story about those kind of boat lists. So yeah. this is like, just like, right? So if you can't do it, bring a guy over and take a look at it for you. Um, that's great. Let's, let's talk about a few add-ons. You, you mentioned one of them, the touchless covers. I think they're fantastic. I, I, I don't even know what the price is for them, but I just, I love the ease of them to, Hey, it, it can be such a pain to cover some boats when they're on the, when they're on a lift or are in that situation uh, about how much are those and, and what's been your experience with them? Positive, negative. So here, here in the, um, Eastern portion of Georgia, northern portion of South Carolina and to, to North Carolina, we introduced the Touches Boat Cover to the market. We had to go out and kind of uh, promote them to the lake management authorities to get permission to put them in on you know lake after lake. That, that generally can take a while. Um, so we're, we're hoping that we'll be able to sell those in Lake Lanier soon. The Touches Boat Cover offers you a range of protection for your boat that's kind of hard to get in any of the competitive product. I'm not just saying that. I mean, I look to sell in area, all the stuff. And I, and I kept coming back to just carrying forward the relationship with the Cutches Boat Cover guys because it's all inclusive. So it's a it's a a, a canvas, well it's a um, high performance marine canvas material that has a, a steel frame at the top, steel frame at the bottom, and it's lowered around your boat through a cable system, this barrel winch like you'd be familiar with with shutter systems or whatnot. It's remote control. You can have an app on your phone to control it. The cool part about it, and I'll just I'll just get right kind of to the point. They're developed in Orlando by an aviation engineer that wanted to go uh, skiing in the morning. He wanted to come home for lunch and go skiing, and he wanted to go skiing in the evening. And you can imagine dragging a cover over a boat three times a day is a nightmare. So originally, he started out with a frame. He had a garage door opener that was used to operate it. 40 people in the, on the lake in his neighborhood, and 20 of them have touched his boat covers. And over <laughs> the 20 years that I'm out there, these things have weathered six named storms. They've weathered all kinds of conditions. And you go out and look. And, you know, there, there's the whole sort of history of this product. And honestly, it's an incredible, uh, incredibly um, strong way of protecting your, your boat from the sun. 
you know, it keeps critters pretty much from trying to get on there. And in, this, in like in the southern latitudes, you know, seabirds, they're going to want to fly over land. They're not going to want to fly under and go into a completely dark space, not knowing where the predators are at. The spiders, things like that, that keeps down. Another thing that keeps down, I think that's most important, is when you've got that thing lowered, uh, guys with sticky fingers riding by looking for, you know, uh, boat electronics to steal, fishing rods. They're not seeing that. And then honestly, it, the, the way that those, uh, they kind of keep the boat, they're warm, they absorb heat. So they're gonna be a little bit warmer and that little bit of warmth kind of pulls air in and it goes out the top with some vents. That air turnover keeps the moisture down on folks' boats. So what the boat cover folks tell us is that your average boat is gonna lose 50% of the value in five years. When you put the boat cover over it, you're gonna cut that in half. So you bought a $40,000 boat, you got a $10,000 boat cover, it's just paid for itself double. And so the beautiful part about it is, yeah, you're going you're gonna to keep the depreciation of your boat down, but by being able to go down and hit the button and cover it in 30 seconds, you're going to want to go out there and boat more. But we yep. have lots of boats out here that come from somewhere else. they got to drop three hours. They wake up on Sunday. They're going to go home. They're going to make that judge, do I, judgment. Do I put the boat cover on or do I go down there and ride for a little while? When, you, when it's 30 seconds, man, it just makes it. People with mobility issues, older folks having to climb around the boat, Makes great sense. So I, I like the boat covers. We've sold them here for a long time. We have a, another another competitor that sells the boat covers here in our area. We're hoping that the whole lake buys them at a certain point because it just adds so much strong value to the customer. So yeah, buy a boat, buy a Tunsil's boat cover wherever you're at in the country. Where, where what what kind of price range uh, for those? And I, I'm sure the applications vary and the size vary, but let's say for like a 25 foot bow rider. Well, we'll just do the range. So if you've got two PWCs, you know, it's kind of kicked off to the side of your dock, you can drop one over those. Those are probably going to start around 4000 bucks. If you've got a 22 to 24 foot pontoon, whether or not you have a roof over it or not, you can put a touchless boat cover on there for around $8,000. So they're not inexpensive. They're really kind of focused on top five to 10% of the boating market. But, you know, if you've got an $80,000 pontoon you just bought and you're thinking about putting maybe $10,000 into a boat cover that's going to keep you from losing 40 grand over five years, it's just a no-brainer to do it. If you got a $500 boat that you got from your drunk Uncle Ted, you're probably not buying a touch of boat cover, right? So it's, it's, a, it, it's for the right folks. Now, you can put the boat covers over do, uh, boat houses, Lake of the Ozarks area. The dealer out there will do a lot less volume over the year, but he's doing a huge boat cover. So, you know, think about a, a, up to 60 feet and then 14 or 16, 18 feet wide. Buses, we put them over people's hot Harleys in their, in their, um, in their garages put them over sports cars. So when it boils down to it, you're going to spend probably generally around starting around eight for a boat. And that can go up to just depending on the size. I looked at some fairly, uh, some incredible boats are on the coast. And we're talking about 20, 22,000 bucks, but this is a half million dollar boat. We're going to cover. So yeah. you can imagine 22 grand versus losing half the value over five years. So it's, it's a wonderful product. Yeah. And I like the, the ease of the ease of use and the using your boat more is I, I've been there. It's Sunday morning. You're packing up the stuff. It's a beautiful day. You're not ready to go home yet, but do I uncover the boat and go for a ride and recover it? Or do I just sit on the dock and, and have my last beer for the day and call it quits? Um, yeah, yeah I, I could see that being, being great. What about the, the electrical current indicators? This is something we added to our dock um, and I really like them. I think they're valuable. What's been your experience with those? And what's the point of them? I'm going to tell you right out of the gate. The best thing that you can do to protect your family from electrical current issues is to have your dock inspected annually by, by a, not just a licensed electrician, but a legitimate contractor that works across commercial applications and marine applications and is out there on the boat dock. We have a, we have a company here locally that's 50, 50 uh, employees. They are world-class when it comes to electrical services. And we have a contract with those guys where they give us a reduction to go out and inspect docks annually. So they're going out there, they're looking for wires that are fraying, they're looking for uh, GFCIs or triggering that shouldn't trigger. They're, they're looking for all sorts of little issues that are gonna make, your, you know, make it dangerous for your family to be out there. But, and the reason why I say that is if you've got something that's, that you can have a problem develop overnight, or you can have somebody that's three docks down from you that has an electrical problem. And you, know, you, you need to have, um, I guess the best way to say it, the detectors work good for that. If you've got somebody over, you know, across the bay, because you can have 200, 300 yards between you and these things will trigger it, right? And you can get zapped when you grab the, grab the ladder when you're coming up out of the water. So the, the, 
the electric current indicators, they've gone through a product development life cycle where they don't quite trigger so often. You can get web interfaces so you can get alerted at your house if there's an issue. All of that is great, but if you start out out of the gate by having uh, not having your drunk Uncle Ted come in and wired up on the weekends, but getting a legitimate electrical contractor that does lots of marine applications, but he's working in other applications, so he's real cognizant of the rules. You're going to start out fresh. He can come back every year. The, the electric current indicators should be something that you add as icing on the top of that in case there's something at your neighbor's place that you don't have any control over. And I'll tell you, this is the most important piece of it. Don't cut costs. I mean, don't cut corners. Don't drag a drop cord down from a power pole and put it on your, on your dock. If you cut corners with electricity, you only get one chance of doing that. Let me tell you something. I, as an electronics technician in a formal life, watching somebody be shocked and you're frozen trying to figure out how to save their life without risking yours, you get 30 to 40 seconds and they're in the water. It is an absolute nightmare condition to put yourself in. Start out by hiring an electrician that knows what they're doing. And the important part of that is the ground, having a ground right there at the power pole that powers your dock. A lot of folks that are not doing this stuff every day or drunk Uncle Ted's, they're going to basically try to ground at the house and you know, 200, 300, quarter mile away. And you're trying to you know, feed back to that ground. It's a subtle little thing that a really good electrician will keep you out of trouble. Yeah, it is a it is a serious issue that you just avoid it altogether. But something to be aware of, something to be conscious of, because it, it can turn uh, disastrous very quickly. Um, well, what about? But you know, yeah. don't, don't just on the, on the product. You know, start out of the gate and prevent the problem to begin with. So yep. sorry to interrupt, you, but it's something you got to stress for sure. No, I, that, that's for sure. What about any dock monitoring services? Hey, we live three hours away uh, from the lake house and we've got our hundred thousand dollar boat sitting there um, under the touchless cover with everything all set, just prime for somebody to, to see what's all on that thing. Um, right. What, uh, what have you experienced and, and what's good, what's bad or, or not worth it at all? All right. So one of the larger lakes here locally is a um, flood control lake. So it's moving up and down. You know, if you're living in Atlanta, we have folks from Arizona, Florida, you, you name it, right? They're not going to be coming up here and moving that dock in and out as the lake levels drop. So if you don't move it and it sits down on the shore, you're going to have problems. So you, it's, it's great to have a relationship with your neighbor that they may come over, but if they're traveling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you're going to have dock, the, the dock monitoring service in our case doesn't, isn't just coming by and doing a well check. Or in our case, every time our, our service folks go out, they do that condition report. Every single time they're taking pictures they're doing the condition report, they're texting it to the customer from the dock. That level of accountability that we were here, this is what we saw, you know, and over time you start to see sort of a track record of conditions for your dock. And so a tree falls on it or it has, a, you know, something bad happens to it and nobody's there to see it. You've got, you know, every month you have a report that shows good condition, good condition, good condition. Now it's a train wreck. You know, so you've got an argument to make with your insurance folks about not, you know, deeply depreciating your dock's value or whatnot. More importantly, we're going to go over there and move your dock in and out. While we're there, we'll do that inspection. Some places you're not going to have that lake level change. So all you need is the well check. And so if you certify, if you get your, well, your, um, your service rep relationship with somebody that's doing docks and doing dock services, they're going to have somebody in your neighborhood pretty much every other day or so. And they can drop by there and see it. My guys know every single one of the folks we have on the service plan because they've been there multiple times. And so when they're in the region, they're riding by, they're swinging over and slowing down and taking a look at it, even if they don't stop and write a report. Or when we're moving the docks in, instead of me having to add a lot of costs associated with the service plans, when my guys are in the area, they're going to move that dock in. If we have, if the lake's changing, you know, dropping really quick or moving up really quick, yeah, then I'll, I'll send somebody out that's dedicated to it. But I'm keeping the cost down and keeping the value high to the customer by adding it in as a layer on top of the overall services we do. So if you're going to do that kind of work, it's just like anything else. You know, Joe with a pontoon that may or may not have insurance, that, you know, it's kind of a one-man show. You know, you, you start talking to him and he's got 200 you know, customers. Imagine how is he getting around and checking on all that stuff? How is he taking care of it? You know, his boat looks like it got hit by a tornado, you know, or it looks like a flea market. You know, those are the kind of guys, there's tons of those guys out there. They'll give you an incredible cost variance between what I'm charging folks to do that. But in the end of the day, are you getting real value to protect your assets? So, you know, it's the same kind of questions you're going to ask about any contractor. Are they reliable? They got a good reputation. You know, when they do the services are a way for me to get out of the contract fairly easily without having headaches or whatnot. And then ultimately, what is it you want them to do in the marine environment? You might want the guys to get out there and put oil in every fitting on every kind of joint that you have on your boat lift every time they come. 
You know, so what it boils down to is what do they offer for my environment? They specialize for my environment. Dog monitoring services, we promote them. We don't make any money. Uh, and in my business, I put the two most senior technicians, the best guys that I have, they do the, the monitoring systems and they do those new little kind of headache kind of, of uh, service work. So my customers get a real quick turnaround. They get a high value um, repair. And then they have a relationship with somebody that's not just, you know, the lowest cost guy that I could find. So he's fixing it the first time. I don't have to revisit. They're out there. They're moving the docks. They're making good decisions. And for us, you know, it's a break-even proposition, but it keeps our customers super happy and coming back to us over and over again. And our business has helped us double every year for the last three or four years by just taking care of the nuisances for the customer. Look for somebody that's getting that kind of a value proposition out of the relationship on the service provider side, and you'll get taken care of every day. Yeah, that, that's great. It's, it's not just I build the dock and then I'm done. It's right. okay. Now we got the major part of it done, but there's things that will make sure that you enjoy it when you're at your lake place and, uh, and not dealing with those headaches and the, the painful things. Uh, Henry, this has been great. Um, I appreciate you sharing all your information. Um, anything that I should have asked, but didn't anything that we need to talk about that you see is, Hey, these are headaches for people that we should have t- covered on. Uh, honestly, not so much. What I would tell you is um, we own a boat dock is not pain free. It's not hands off. You know, it's, if you leave a puppy on the side of the road, something bad's going to happen to it, right? Or it's going to disappear. But the boat dock, you know, if you're living out of state, you're living somewhere else, don't expect to just be able to leave it there and come back. And it. With your, you know, with your boat, same thing. You put it on the lift, you tuck off. Well, a muskrat might come and eat, the, eat on the hose. You might have an electrical short in a control panel. You know, it's worth the money to have somebody that's monitoring your asset if you're not able and close to do it. And even if you do live in town, 30 minutes away, do you want to drop everything at work and come rolling over and try to have to move a boat dock in or save a boat dock? Get somebody that does it for a living that's going to make it easy and the economics of it will work out over time. If you can't afford, it's like anything, you might be able to buy a Lamborghini, but if you can't afford to service it, you probably shouldn't have bought a Lamborghini. Same yep. with a boat dock. Yeah, that, that's great. Well, hey, I, I appreciate you sharing this. This is going to people all over the, the country, but if they happen to be in the, um, in the Georgia um, South Carolina, Tennessee, North Carolina area. Um, how can they get in touch with you and and um, and find out more information? Or maybe use one of your services. So you can go to tmdocs.com and put in a request for services from us. You can call me at, at, our, at our office here at 864-226-8169. Uh, the folks that answer the phone will get all your details or whatnot, and they'll you know get one of us that's on the technical side of the fence to give you a call, help you out with your questions. Be more than happy to talk to you about doc related issues or whatnot. You know, it's what we, it's what we do for a living, so we'd love to work with you. Um, it's something we talked about in the beginning of the business. Um, here at TNM, we offer a couple of different things. We do a traditional fabrication shop, so the the boat dock folks are a big piece of the business. But we build stuff like uh, steel for buildings, mezzanines. We build you know, lots of gadgets and widgets for folks that take uh, mechanical construction type uh, um, uh, trade skills. We also have a construction business. We do um, pipe fitting for. Um, basically for factories that will do food construction for energy production, pretty much anything that you need a pipe for would basically do it. So for residential housing, and we've kind of specialized on here. We have some great, between me and the guys that work on the crew here, we have hundreds of years of experience doing that kind of work. So we'd love to help you out of the lake, but if you make a living building stuff, give us a call. We'll help you in the factory. <laughs> Very good. Well, hey, Henry, I appreciate it. I can't wait to meet your drunk Uncle Ted. That guy sounds like he's going to have some stories in him. <laughs> but, uh, you know something stupid is going to happen. Yeah, exactly. I like that. Hey, I really enjoyed this. I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and expertise with everybody. I, I know they do as well. And, uh, and again, get in touch with him if you're in his area. And uh, he'd be glad to be glad to help you out. Oh, TM Custom Boat Docs. Hey, I appreciate the opportunity to participate, Matt. Thank you.